turned uh, anarchist turned Bolshevik Victor Serge, Golos Trudeau was an influential, widely distributed journal, which at one time competed with Pravda in the factories of Petrograd. The anarchists saw a rapid expansion of the ranks in 1917 and 1918. Largely under the guidance, writes Kenyon Zimmer, of returned anarchists from, uh, from America. The most well-known anarchist member of the URW was Boleyn. Boleyn quit law school at St. Petersburg University in 1904 to devote himself fully to organizing workers. On January 9, 1905, Boleyn was among those who marched on the Winter Palace to demand the establishment of a constant constitutional republic, but also higher wages and shorter hours at work. What became known as Bloody Sunday, the Russian Tsar and his officers responded by firing on the crowd, killing and wounding several hundred, which marked the start of the 1905 revolution. Bolin then took on a leading role in the formation of the first Soviet in St. Petersburg later that year. Exiled to France for his revolutionary activity, he became an anarchist and over the next several years, he continued to organize workers while writing for anarchist newspapers, including Golos Trudeau in New York. Hunted by the French police for his anti-war agitation in 1916, Boleyn fled, fled the country by sneaking on the ocean line or Lafayette to New York. He had to work his way across the Atlantic, shoveling coal in the boiler room. And on the topic of ocean liners, transatlantic ocean liners, I recently came across an interesting fact about the Titanic uh, involving the URW. European-based Russian anarchist writers like Bolin would mail their articles to New York, which was carried on ships. In a memoir written by the anarchist A.A. Karelin, he says that six of his articles intended for Golos Trudeau were, quote, drowned together with the Titanic, Katanushi. Um, <clears throat> Bolin was arrested in the, uh, by the Red Army in 1921 for denouncing the Bolsheviks. Uh, looking back on this period in 1940, Bolin described a remarkable conversation he had with Leon Trotsky in New York in March 1917. Trotsky had moved to New York in early January 1917, expecting to lead the Russian socialist movement in the United States until the February Revolution broke out. At the printer's shop, where they both awaited their respective newspapers to come off the press, Bolin told Trotsky that he expected the Bolsheviks to take power in Russia and persecute the anarchists. You will begin to persecute us just as soon as your power has been consolidated, said Bolin, and you will end by having a shot down. Nonsense, replied Trotsky. It was nonsense to think Marxists would resolve their differences by turning their guns on the anarchists. What do you take us for, cried Trotsky. He tried to alleviate Bolin's concern by stating that Marxists were, quote, anarchists in the final analysis. The only thing is that you want to introduce your anarchism straight away without transition or preparation. Trotsky dismissed the distinction as, quote, a little question of methodology, quite secondary. Two and a half years later, after Volin was arrested by the Red Army, his captors asked Trotsky by telegram what should be done with the anarchist, and Trotsky wrote back, shoot, out of hand. However, Volin was spared, uh, fairly. Uh, the organization of a continent-wide federation that would become the Union of Russian Workers began to take shape when Golos Trudeau was launched in March 1911. One of the mo URW's most important founding members was Bill Shatov, um, who traveled the country organizing strikes while setting up URW branches, while also working with the, the industrial workers of the world. Pictured here on the left alongside the leader is, uh, is Bill, Shat um, sorry, Bill Haywood, the leader of the IWW in the middle, and on the right is Bulgarian uh, wobbly leader, George Andrechin. Um, for example, Shatov's uh, strike is one example of his, uh, what he did in the United States. In 1913, Shatov helped uh, organize an IWW-led strike of Russian, Polish, and Lithuanian workers at the Spreckles Sugar Refinery in Philadelphia. The success of this strike led to the formation of the IWW's local number eight of marine transport workers on the nearby Philadelphia docks, which became one of the most powerful wobbly unions and the most ethnically diverse union in the country, composed largely of African Americans and Eastern European immigrants. Shatov was also a point man for the Union of Russian Workers and the Garment Industry Unions, negotiating on, on behalf of Russian-speaking workers. Shatov's uncle, 
excuse me. During the 1905 Russian Revolution, Shatov fought in Jewish self-defense units around Kiev and was arrested several times. Shatov's uncle had been killed in a pogrom near Kiev, and Tsarist persecution in general had, his, had reduced his family to beggary. He fled to the United States and began organizing for the Wobblies in 1909, converted to anarchism, and then helped start the URW over the next two years. Shatov often lectured at large rallies alongside people like Haywood and Emma Goldman. One somewhat critical correspondent wrote of Shatov, quote, delivering incendiary harangues in the noon hour, shouting through debates and halls, organizing strikes among the sweating foreigners, and collecting funds for the cause of the proletariat. Shatov commended himself to every mob because of his instant humor, his contagious emotion, and his genuine sympathy for the workers. Unlike his colleagues at Golos Truda and most Russian anarchists in general, Shatov backed the Bolshevik state in 1918 while remaining an anarchist. He had impressed Trotsky and Lenin and was given several prominent positions, including being put in charge of the defense of Petrograd against an attack by white general Nikolai Yudenich. Later, he was put in charge of the project to build the Turkestan Siberian Railway and was featured in a few New York, uh, articles in the New York Times, such as this one from 1930. Despite his loyalty to the, to the Soviet state, Shatov was killed in Stalin's purges around uh, 1937. This picture might look familiar. Um, the rest of the leadership of the Union of Russian Workers opposed the Bolsheviks, including Aaron and Fanya Baron. Aaron Baron had been exiled to Siberia after the 1905 revolution. <clears throat> and in 1912, he escaped to the United States and immediately joined the anarchist movement there. In Chicago, he met Fanya Greffinson, also an anarchist. Um, this photo of the Barons uh, was, which uh, Kenny Zimmer showed earlier, was taken in Chicago sometime in the 1910s, and it was given to a, a colleague, colleague of ours, Malcolm Archibald, at, at Black Cat Press, by a relative of Barons who currently lives in Montreal. Uh, Aaron Barron was killed in Stalin's purges as well after spending years fighting against the regime in prison and in exile. Like other anarchists, Barron had criticized the Bolsheviks for creating a dictatorship over rather than of the proletariat, for usurping power, crushing worker strikes, and imprisoning or killing left-wing dissidents. <clears throat> it has been estimated that 90% of the anarchists who returned to Russia from America were killed by the Soviet gov government under either Lenin or Stalin. <clears throat> Fanny Baron was shot by the Cheka in 1921. The Bolsheviks claimed Fanny was involved in the bombing of the Moscow headquarters of, of the Communist Party, which killed 12 members of the party committee. M Emma Goldman wrote, of, quote, our dear splendid Fania, radiant with life and love. She had fought to the last breath. <clears throat> she resisted and had to be carried bodily to the place of execution by the Knights of the Communist State. Rebel to the last, Fania had pitted her enabled strength against the monster for a moment and then was dragged into eternity as the hideous silence of the Chekhov cellar was rent once more by her shrieks above the sudden pistol shots. I had reached the end, <clears throat> Golden continued. Could bear it no longer. In the dark, I groped my way to Sasha and Alexander Berkman to leave Russia by whatever means, only far away from the blood, the tears, and the stalking death. In addition to Fanya Baron, other Russian Jewish women of the, in the Union of Russian Workers included Rose Basada, mentioned earlier, who became a well known labor leader of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union into the 1920s and 30s, as well as Dora Lipkin and Rose and Ethel Bernstein were rounded up during the infamous Palmer Raids of 1919 and deported to Russia alongside 250 other members of the Union of Russian Workers. There was also a Union of Women Workers, Soyuz Robotnik's section within the URW that hosted meetings and lectures with Russian, Yiddish, and English speakers. The Women's Union rallied 300 Russian women in support of street demonstrations that spread across New York City in February and March 1917 to protest unaffordable prices on basic foods and clothing. Prices had gone up 82% in the previous two years. Thousands of women from all boroughs took to the streets in desperation, fighting against hunger and against the police who tried to shut them down. On February 24th, 100,000 women 
and children attended a hunger demonstration at Madison Square. <clears throat> Before the 1917 revolution turned their attention to Russia, URW organizers had been able to recruit thousands of workers in the United States through the organizing talent of its leaders, but also because of the terrible economic and social conditions experienced by workers in the United States, which helped radicalize many Russian immigrants and turn them into anarchists. Poor conditions for workers, together with high unemployment and extreme inequality, led to violent labor struggle, struggles across the United States. Picture is of the famous Bread and Roses uh, strike, where 30,000 immigrant textile workers struck in, Ma in Lawrence, Massachusetts, against hazardous working conditions and low wages. In the extremely cold winter of 1914-1915, the IWW organized a series of demonstrations of the unemployed with participation from Russian anarchists. For example, Aaron and Fania Barron helped Lucy Parsons organize and lead a demonstration in Chicago that was violently broken up by the police. Lucy Parsons was a longtime anarchist activist and the widow of Albert Parsons, who was hung by the state of Illinois, in 18, 1887, as most people know, thousands of unemployed workers gathered to hear speeches by Parsons and Aaron Barron, while Fania Barron led a Russian choir in the singing of revolutionary songs. They had intended to march the streets of Chicago, but as soon as they went outside, mounted police started clubbing people indiscriminately, and Fania Barron was knocked unconscious while Parsons and 20 others were arrested and put in jail. In these conditions, many immigrants from Russia had found themselves broke, isolated, and living on the margins of society. As a response to these conditions, and as part of their broader labor and political organizing strategy, the Union of Russian Workers organized mutual aid societies modeled on Jewish relief organizations such as Arbiter Ring, the Workmen's Circle, discussed earlier also by Kenyon to provide food and shelter for the homeless and social settings for, for Russians to get together. In addition to forming their own groups, uh, the URW also joined and helped lead Russian divisions of the workmen's circle in several cities, including New York, Brownsville, uh, Chicago, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. The first Russian division of Arbiter Ring opened in New York in 1910 and was chaired by the Union of Russian Workers Brooklyn Secretary and it remained active throughout the decade. The division was involved in raising money to attend to the medical needs of Russians, for example, raising funds for those sick with tuberculosis. By mid-1915, orders from uh, Europe for ammunition um, and supplies had started to revive the U.S. economy. In mid-1915, workers began striking in larger numbers across numerous industries demanding their share of the profits. And by early 1916, capitalists were facing a large-scale rebellion among workers of all skills. Anarchists seized the moment, and members of the Union of Russian Workers organized in labor unions. I'll just end here quickly. Um, there's another strike. <clears throat> so on, on this issue of anarchism and its relation to, to the labor movement, I think the Union of Russian Workers had some interesting ideas. And I just wanted to lay out and introduce a new character uh, Golos Trudeau's editorial line on the issue of anarchism and labor was articulated by the newspaper's principal editor from 1914 to 1917, Maxim Ryevsky, who wrote, anarchist communists, Bakunin, Kropotkin, and others, based their theories on the experience of the labor movement and considered them valuable only insofar as the masses recognized in these theories the realization of their own hopes and aspirations. According to Ryevsky and other Golos Trudeau writers, the strength, if not legitimacy, of the anarchist movement rested on its ability to appeal to the masses, which in industrialized countries were located primarily in working class and labor movements. Ryevsky, the Baron, Shatov, Aline, Bolin, the Raiva brothers, and others aimed to turn the Union of Russian Workers into a mass organization in the United States, not just an anarchist one. And this meant integration into the labor movement. They sought to unite the Russian left and wanted all Russian-speaking workers to join and to lead all Russian speaking sections of labor unions in North America. They attracted a large following because of their responsiveness to the needs and desires and desires of ordinary immigrants. I'm going to give some more examples of strikes that they participated in, but I think we're out of time. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we've got Nina 
Garyanova. And Nina teaches at the Department of Slavic Languages and Literature at Northwestern University. Her scholarship is in the fields of literature and art history, and it encompasses both Russian and European modernist and avant-garde movements with a specific emphasis on the interrelation of aesthetics and politics. She has authored and edited six books on the Russian avant-garde and published extensively in Europe, the United States, and Russia. Nina has served as, as the primary exhibit or exhibition consult for the Museum of Modern Art in New York and participated in the organization of many exhibits. Her most recent book, The Aesthetics of Anarchy, won the A-A-T-S-E-E-L book, Best Book in Literature, <laughs> Literary Cultural Studies Annual Award. And you can explain to us what that acronym is for. Nina? Uh, Julie. Thank you very much for such a lovely um, introduction, lovely and lively. So let's, you know, mystery of anagrams remains the mystery. So it will be ah, 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 the, as I can repeat that uh, from alpha to omega, right, phrase. And let me not waste time because we don't have, actually, we're not allowed much time. So let me just start. Um, interconnections between art, politics, aesthetics, and ethics, a long-standing feature of Russian civil society. And this is particularly true during the tumultuous year of Russian Revolution, especially the years of 1970 and 1918, when nothing yet was determined, when the Russian Communist Party, the Bolshevik, or majority in translation, faction of the Marxist Russian Social Democratic Party, that was the original name, Marxist Russian Social Democratic Party, which then was remained in the communist, struggled to size state power and wide with anarchists and other leftist parties to determine the course of future events. Unfortunately, we know that the future events were developing pretty tragically for other leftist parties, which were uh, respectively crushed uh, by uh, the Bolshevik uh, fraction um, in the next, in the following three or four years section. My previous work, um, you know, was examining the cultural politics of the Moscow newspaper, Anarchia, Anarchy in translation, again, not anarchism, anarchy, and the role of the avant-garde artist in this paper. But today I would like to look at the aspect um, which uh, was defined um, by one of the previous speakers as Yiddish cosmopolitanism and um, its role in the forming actually um, cultural scene uh, in um, around 1918 and I would say for beyond. Paul Overage, whom I don't think I have to introduce in this uh, audience, does note that by March 1918, Moscow, where there had been fewer than 100 anarchists before 1917, because as uh, you know, the previous um, speaker, uh, Mark, uh, reported that after the revolution of 1905-1907, which actually, you know, I would disagree. I won't define it as truly socialist revolution. As written. I'd rather say that was probably anarchist uh, revolution because it was spontaneous. It came really as an initiative of students, of soldiers, of workers, and it uh, was multi-ethnic. Um, it was kind of like the organization and activism was happening while uh, the historical ones were developing. Therefore, uh, there was no kind of like real center 
uh, controlling it. And th that was, uh, I think, one of the amazing, the most amazing historic events, which is not yet, uh, you know, uh, thoroughly researched. So after 1907, um, a lot of uh, participants, uh, be it, you know, Jewish or Russian or Latvian or Polish or anybody else, uh, you know, because there were multiple nationalities and ethnicities in the Russian Empire and uh, as many languages, had to uh, run, run a hide. Therefore, the scene uh, between 1907 and 1917 was pretty quiet in anarchist development in Russia because <laughs> it was very thoroughly banned because somehow anarchists were always linked to the most extreme radical acts of terrorism, uh, you know, was it justified or not? I'm not here to say that, but uh, that was the attitude of power. Uh, and uh, practically, uh, you know, there was a Moscow organization of Moscow group of anarchist syndicalists, um, which was uh, acting uh, actually in the underground, uh, risking a lot of, uh, you know, their well-being um, because they, if they discovered, uh, they could be imprisoned. Nonetheless, still spreading information, and they managed to set up an un underground typography in Moscow. So when the February uh, revolution or putsch happened in 1917 in Moscow, and um, you know there was an abdication of mor monarchy. Therefore, uh, practically, uh, you know, it was this very free moment, but again, unfortunately, you know, um, in terms of historical chronology, it was just a moment of a uh, couple of months. Then anarchists could came back, they could uh, be legalized, and they start using this typography established by this underground uh, Moscow group of anarchist syndicalists, right, led by Hudali. And um, they regrouped into what they called uh, Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups, uh, which actually counted in it, uh, you know, several, I mean, almost, almost close to 50 or more anarchist groups from fractions of Bund to Tolstoy's Christian anarchists. And um, that became very powerful organization because it had to combine practically for the first time anarchists kind of like united because you know Spencer mentioned here that you know anarchists are radical they radical towards themselves so it was for the first time that there was this incredible will for tolerance and understanding. And I think this will for to tolerance and understanding inspired the creation of uh, newspaper Anarchia. Uh, Moscow became a center of anarchist activity by then, by March 1918. And uh, anarchist communist organ, Burivesnik, the stormy petrol in translation, it's actually, you know, from one of the Borky's little stories taken a uh, name, had taken, according to Paul Avrish, whom I said here, a back place to Anarchia, the daily newspaper of the Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups. Uh, this um, newspaper was uh, published and edited by uh, many people, uh, starting from Apollon Karelin and ending with Gordon Brothers, who actually moved from Moscow from Petrograd, including um, German Askarov, uh, who uh, was uh, a very prominent, another very prominent um, Jewish anarchist uh, of, of the time. Um, the situation in Moscow was conducive to this development because before the suppression of the city's anarchist factions in early July 1918, the Moscow Federation of Anarchist Groups had become a susceptible force in the political arena, unlike Russian anarchism, more fragmented Petrograd groups, uh, mostly centered uh, around um, communists. 
And in the words of Communist Party functionary, one of the Latvian riflemen, Jan Peters, Moscow's anarchists constituted, I quote uh, his interview from uh, newspaper Izvestia of 11, April 11, 1918, Moscow anarchists constituted a second political power and the threat to the communist regime. So what I think was so amazing in uh, the uh, newspaper um, Anarchia, and that's the aspects which I would like to uh, introduce uh, today, it's actually, um, first of all, the development from local, um, you know, small newspaper to truly national anarchist newspaper, practically number one, in 1918 in Russia. And second, a uh, newspaper published in Russian by the general editors who were speakers of both Yiddish and Russian, Abin Leiba Gordon, who signed their you know, periodicals and their front page essays, which they would write for every other issue in Russian, signed by Bratio Gordon and Brothers Gordon. And um, incredible ability actually to accumulate and to centralize around uh, this uh, newspapers, all the different voices, uh, voices which would be respondent, for example, to very important trade union of railroad workers, because railroad was the ma main transportation back then and the main connection. So if you have railroads, you have you know, very important instrument to get uh, political power. Uh, and Kazimir Kovalevich, Polish by origin, was publishing there quite often. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, the editorial staff included uh, from September 13, when the first issue was published, till July 2nd, 1918, uh, with some interruptions due to government raids and temporary arrests of the editorial staff, uh, were run by Barmash, German Askar, uh, whose real name was Igapsun, and the brothers Abba, Abba Ben Yehuda Leib, and Dave Gordon, who even signed the editorials uh, together, as I mentioned before. The first nine issues came out weekly from September through uh, to early November of 1917, and after a break, the newspaper resumed in March um, 1918 as a daily with a new and large format. Today, only two complete sets of the newspaper, 99 issues, <laughs> all together survive. Um, from the start, um, Anarchia actually responded to uh, the needs uh, of the workers, of the soldiers, and was striving also to, be very, to build very significant audience among intelligentsia. And there was no particular emphasis on, uh, you know, ethnicity or actually even social class. And in this regard, I think it was just brilliant decision by Gordon Brothers to expand, to branch away from, uh, you know, group oriented towards uh, ethnic needs, uh, towards, you know, particular population into the whole you know, audience for the whole empire. And I think that's what propelled this newspaper towards a national newspaper without actually kind of like losing very important elements of, uh, if you wish, um, um, not particularly Jewishness in it, but interest and importance of Jewish contribution uh, to uh, the movement. First of all, it runs a lot of translations, translations from German, translations from Yiddish and from English of the most contemporary st uh, start. Um, second, um, it constantly would uh, bring up the issue of uh, anti-Semitism and fight against it. Um, the issue of uh, violence introduced by uh, Bolshevik government towards any fractions, and a uh, very important uh, issue of new market, which was emerging market for arts and for literature, and the way how artists should behave in this situation. Um, 
as well as um, very um, important role of education. Education, not only children education, but also workers club and workers education group. Even more so, by 1918, the artists Kazimir Malevich, Alexander Rochenko, Vladimir Tatlin, and others who at the time called themselves anarcho-futurists, along with the poets Rurik Ivnev, the pseudonym of Mikhail Kovalev, Bayan Plamin, Vladimir Sidorov, also known as Vadim Bayan, Svetagor, and Alexei Gastev, who later actually was leading one of the major institutes in the Soviet Union Institute of Labor, regularly published articles on art, literature, culture, and politics in the specially organized by Gordon's section called Creativity of Anarchist Newspaper. This Creativity section was edited by Alexei Gunn, who, uh, you know, is often looked upon as a father of Russian constructivism, and actually the person who authored the first uh, program and doctrine of constructivism, uh, the, the book called Constructivism, even before, you know, the practice developed, even before all this, you know, famous um, works, you know, by Rochenko, et cetera, et cetera, who actually also participated very actively there in the newspaper. And um, what uh, was the most uh, important is that is for the first time ever, avant-garde artists in Russia participated in political newspaper. And that was in anarchist newspaper. And participated not just, you know, submitting one or two essays, by leading their own section and by uh, Rochenko submitted something like 50 essays, Malevich even more, uh, Gunn, I think, was a champion on that, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The headquarters of the Federation's newspaper were originally on Krimsky Wall, and soon moved to the former Merchant Club of uh, Moscow on Malay Dmitrovka Street, which was rechristened the House of Anarchy. Later, after the Bolsheviks laid siege to the House of Anarchy, the newspaper moved uh, to Nastasinsky Periolk, where the Boyd's Cafe, uh, with, you know, active triad of uh, Maikovsky, uh, Kamensky, and Burluk, who established their own little anarchist group, uh, which was not part of Anarchia, but rather did, was fight by Anarchia. Um, so that's where uh, newspaper Anarchia uh, moved. Uh, while originally Anarchia uh, w was welcoming euphorically, actually, what they call proletarian social revolution and power seizure by the autonomous Soviets, which means in Russian, actually, the Soviet means in Russian a council or a board, because it's a very wrong translation for the past hundred years, represent that. Um, so it's a Council of Board of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. That's what means Soviet originally. The original concept of such Soviets directly corresponded to the anarchist political and structural models of autonomy and decentralization, which later was perverted and oppressed by the strict Bolshevik party regulations and centralized uh, control. So even so, originally, they were welcoming the revolution, and here I will cite one of the Gordon's essays from a newspaper, um, English translation is mine. We should contrast the bourgeois chaos uh, based on the oppression and exploitation of one man by another with the free independent organization of equals, a new world of free will comrades, free workers in a free union of liberated communities communes. Revolution is the greatest joy, first of all, the universal celebration of the premonition of a new life. There should be no pogroms, no victims, and no bloodshed excesses, except as a strictly necessary self-defense. And I think, you know, uh, this um, tolerance, uh, this kind of like multifaceted uh, nature of the newspaper, which united all these groups together, under the leadership of two Yiddish anarchists, Brothers Gordon, pay back. And um, the uh, idea of creativity became uh, the unifying idea here. 
Uh, this idea since March 1918 allowed the volume and the structure of newspaper to change significantly. Instead of two, now there were four pages of much bigger format, and it runs serious and thorough overview of political news and the ones in Russia and abroad. Even more so, the ideological platform of the newspaper slightly shifted as well. Following the brief changes in the political and historical reality, there was a strong feeling of disillusionment and more and more criticism towards Bolshevik dictatorial politics, especially Trotsky's policies of red terror and street uh, executions without trial or tribunal. Human life is devalued. One can be shot by accident following the accidental detainment, bitterly wrote Abba Gordon in his editorial on the nightly executions of anarchists in Moscow in April of uh, 1918. But the main goal was achieved because Renew Re 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 Daily succeeded in its attempts to engage new readership, especially among students and intelligentsia. The next step was to address the anarchist-spirited writers and artists in order to attract the like-minded new authorship. And I would like to say that considering Malevich's participation and I did deep research on it and published on it, um, you know, many times, so I don't want to repeat myself here, but I think, uh, you know, the famous Vitebsk commune of Yanovis, which mostly considered of young Jewish artists of this population who came to power by rejecting on one part shtetl, on another part, um, you know, any kind of like uh, dogmatic, statehood, um, this anarchist commune of Yanovis wouldn't be possible without the experience Malevich had in newspaper anarchy. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. That was really interesting. Uh, if we have a mic, we have a mic. We have a mic. If people would like to uh, ask questions and maybe direct them to one or all of the speakers. We have two mics. Look at that. Sir. I don't think your mic is on. Hold on one sec. Uh, so sure, that's a great question, and it, it leads into a. Uh, okay, the question was about uh, the Bielostok pogrom, and that uh, Bielostok had a very large Jewish population and a significant Jewish anarchist uh, population, uh, which we don't know very much about, uh, to be frank. Um, and there was lots of talk between the connection between Jewish anarchists in the U.S. and Jewish anarchists in Russia. Uh, during this time, but the connections were very ephemeral. There weren't very sturdy connections. So we know, for instance, that people were sending back literature from the U.S., where really the best publishing houses were, the best newspapers were, sending them to, to Russia, where people were radicalizing quite quickly, not only anarchists, but socialists um, as well, and uh, of many different types. Um, and the anarchists are very interested in this, and they're always reporting on it. In fact, all of the Jewish press is quite concerned about reports about Jewish anarchists in Bialystok, and they were of the hundreds of pogroms, um, there's maybe 20 or 30 that I've found that were blamed on anarchists, that uh, basically, the, you know, the, the police say after the pogrom, well, well you know, uh, a Jewish anarchist shot someone, and so what could we do but shoot all of the Jews? I mean, there were no other options. Um, and so, but basically, the, the, from what I've seen, the anarchists in the U.S. don't know anything more about it uh, than that. So um, I believe with Bialystok there were 
uh, Jewish anarchists involved in the fighting. Um, there were uh, uh, self-defense groups um, that form not only with the Bund, but with other groups of Zionist groups, of Zionist-backed groups as well, that formed all over the um, Palestine element as a re reaction to the 1905 revolution, which um, then increased up until uh, up until 1917 and into the uh, the civil war period, which is where, where the most pogroms are. Um, and anarchists are a part of that. Uh, it's not clear to me exactly who's the institutional backing the most in 1905. It, 1905 is a really sporadic, like it's not clear what's going on. As was said before, it was quite chaotic. Um, so it's difficult to parse who was where. Uh, the, the birth and the growth of the anarchist movement uh, was stimulated on one side, side by the social economic condition in, in a country, and on the other hand, by the system uh, willingness and tolerance to allow the, the ideas to grow and, and evolve. So if you look in the exposition, we heard what happened in Russia and United States. Uh, what, what would you say that there was a more propitious uh, environment for evo evolution and growth of anarchistic movement toward uh, positive results? I think in the, so I think in the United States in the 1910s, <clears throat> that was more, it's on. Yeah. It is on, please. Um, it was a more conducive environment for, for, to build up the anarchist movement. In fact, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why so many Russian anarchists, Jewish anarchists, went to the United States because they could organize relatively freely uh, for a long time. They could publish newspapers. Um, it was relatively free compared to Russia, right? That, that ended sometime around 1916 or started to come to an end sometime around 1916 and 1917 when a red scare sort of you know, swept over the United States with, because of the war and the rise of the labor movement. So when the labor movement rose up in the mid 1910s, um, people in power got scared, capitalists got scared, and they started to crack down on radicals and, and workers and, and, and these anarchists who were trying to rally the workers and building, you know, building up these mass movements and these strikes. So certainly the United States was a lot freer um, during that period. Um, I'll say that uh, Paul Everich, who's a the major, what we now deceased major historian of Russian uh, anarchism and, and American anarchism, um, has uh, great bits on sociologically what the difference is between people who are attracted to socialism and people who are attracted to anarchism uh, in Russia, which uh, I think, to, to my knowledge, hasn't really been done you know, in the U.S. It's, it's still work that needs to be done about what attracted people to anarchism precisely over other movements. But he says that in Russia, um, Jews mostly worked in shops, so small, not a factory, but a, a sort of small area with maybe 10 to 20 people where your boss was usually your father-in-law or your uncle or some like a family friend, someone you knew really well who had taken you on as uh, something like an apprentice, the, the term is going out of use. Um, and, that, and then other Jews in cities like Bielostok worked in factories, which were just starting to come to Russia, where there would be maybe a sort of a Jewish-owned factory with, um, 300, 400 workers in it. That's a very different sociological space um, because you didn't know your boss. So uh, what the socialists would do uh, in the 1905 instance, most, most of them were nonviolent. Um, and so they were better in the shops because you didn't want to kill your father-in-law, usually. Um, <laughs> so uh, they, they would say, well, we can strike. We're going to have you know, mass rallies. We're going to embarrass you in front of your shop until you, you know, give us better workers' rights where the anarchists would just say, we'll come and threaten to kill your boss. And uh, for factory workers, that was great because they didn't necessarily have that sociological connection. So you see these pockets of anarchism grow in oftentimes in places where there is more urbanism uh, and more urban industrialism. In the US, uh, in some cases, it seems to be the opposite. It's not exactly clear where the line is, but it's interesting research to be done. I'll just add two words because, you know, in Russia, as well as, I guess, in general, in the world, there are three major, um, you know, tendencies in anarchism. It's anarchic communism, anarchic syndicalism, and individual anarchism. So I would say that individual anarchism actually uh, 
was uh, taking over in the period between first and second Russian Revolution, between 1907 and 17, uh, because of many different reasons. One of them, of course, uh, you know, it was uh, not so directly involved with politics. And another, uh, it was rather, you know, um, philosophical approach to anarchy and anarchism. And I think that's uh, the difference in the Russian situation, and I don't mean Russian ethnically, I just, you know, the name, use geopolitical name for the particular historical date, right, of 1907, 1917. Uh, there was much more affinity than anywhere except probably, you know, France in the end of 19th century, in the 1880s and 1890s, with arts and literature. And uh, I think that also, uh, you know, kind of like showed in uh, and was reflected in the creation of such a unique uh, periodical as uh, newspaper Anarchia. Yeah, in 1898, a beloved president, William McKinley, was assassinated by a Polish anarchist, Szalgusz, and one would, well, it led to the age of Roosevelt, who was a strange person, so I, I can see that there wouldn't be an immediate push against anarchists from someone of his mentality, but it, it certainly didn't bode well, I would think, for the anarchists movement and for potential anarchist planning, you know, in America. Or maybe just it was ignored and not thought of in that way. Uh, yeah, so um, McKinley is shot in 1901 by Leon Czolgosz, who's a, he's, um, uh, he's not an immigrant. His parents were, were Polish immigrants. Uh, he had been, he was been a, basically an unemployed steel worker. Uh, an anarchist, there was lots of debates, still are debates about whether he was crazy or not. Um, there's a really great book, actually, I recommend uh, to any non-academic, too, called Murdering McKinley, um, which is half about sort of anarchism and the history of psychological interests in immigrants and, and the progressive era. But um, yeah, so after 1901, there's big talks, uh, which um, work, of uh, instituting various laws to stop anarchists. One is, becomes known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act, in 1903, which um, forbids people from entering uh, the country who are anarchists, and it's it's one of uh, and there's another law that forbids uh, what's called criminal anarchy, um, or the advocation of criminal anarchy. So you, Emma Goldman could no longer go and say take the bread because this is seen as a violent thing. But it was actually quite easy for anarchists to just change their language and to get around this law if they wanted to. Um, whether the police were actually enforcing it based on the reality of the law is is another question. But then anarchists found that. Um, they could abuse these laws for their own gain if they want. So the Ellis Island, uh, not a police chief, but head says that in 30 years they um, got maybe uh, 12 anarchists. I forget what the number is exactly, because you can just say you're not an anarchist when you come in. And that's what people do. And the, and the people who are caught are people who, it seems, intentionally get caught. So uh, Turner, John Turner, is an English anarchist who comes, who's brought to the US with the intention of being caught by the anarchist law, and then he's put in a cage in prison, and then all of these people, not only anarchists, but even people who work for the government, liberals are saying this is a freedom of speech issue, this, uh, you know, these laws have to be overturned, and then this really leads only to positive things in the anarchist movement, it's really propaganda in their favor. So uh, yes, many, many things do come out of this movement, they don't really affect anarchists, but they do affect even now how the US controls uh, basically political dissent, uh, particularly with people who, um, are crossing borders, uh, these, these acts are still cited today, so. Well, I, I think that um, to some extent, Berkman's attempted assassination of Henry Frick and then the incident with Chagos did kind of shake, shake up the anarchist movement a bit. And I think that's why you saw an increasing turn toward, uh, toward labor organizing as a, as, a, as a way to, you know, did this hurt, did, that, did these incidents hurt the anarchist movement? Well, maybe to some extent, but I mean, there was a, there was a conscious effort to to get involved in, in mass or organizing with the labor movement. Um, and so, um, you know, it's still an open question. Um, just a quick note about uh, McKinley's assassination. He's, uh, Cholgash is widely um, disavowed by anarchists, uh, with the major exception of Emma Goldman, uh, who refuses to disavow him and says, you know, I believe that he is an anarchist, because most anarchists say he's not. 
um, and that I don't necessarily think what he was doing is right. Uh, McKinley wasn't that hated as far as presidents go. Um, but, you know, it's still an anarchist action and we have to accept that. And so that causes a lot of rife within the movement and, and other reactions to the McKinley assassination. I don't know if that mic is working. Do you want to try it? No, why don't you come to this mic? Because you can hear, but they can't hear. Hi, I have a question to Mark and to Nina. The question is about the pairing of politics and culture, but also about brotherhood. And the question will not be about the brothers Gordon, but about the Eichenbaum brothers. So Wollen and Boris Eichenbaum, right? So I was wondering whether um, there are studies of the relationship between to the two brothers, whether in your research into Gols Truda or the correspondence, something interesting came up. I know that Boris Eichenbaum did publish an article in Gols Truda um, I think in the 1918 or 1919, uh, but I wonder if there's more. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, not to my knowledge, but um, there should be something in the archives. I just am not aware that anybody is working on it because, you know, Spencer said in his introductory word, uh, anarchism is still kind of like irritates idiots anywhere in academia and outside. And, you know, one of my distinguished tenured colleague was once, uh, you know, was saying like, well, yes, and this artist is definitely a big, a growing anarchist because he was getting up late and was late for, uh, for the meetings, you know. <laughs> what can you say? It's time, it's time to recognize that there is a special discipline which is called anarchist studies. And, you know, it would be great if somebody, you know, following generation would, would look into that because it brings the whole issue of formalism. Of course, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Great question, thank you. Anybody else on that? Uh, I don't think that mic is working, so why doesn't, oh, it's working. <coughs> I, I don't think any of you referenced this directly, but back in Eastern Europe, there was a significant Jewish participation even in the leadership of the Machnavite uh, anarchists, but at the same time that movement has a reputation for being anti-Semitic. And I don't know which, which is actually, I know that the Jews were involved, but was the, the anti-Semitism from the top or just from Ukrainian peasants that were participating in it? I don't believe it was from the top. I mean, earlier historians that gave Makhno that reputation